I'm excited to hear from our next pre presenter. He's fairly new to the CRF and um, learn more about his work. Dr. Donnie Saw works at the University of California, Irvine, uh, Gavin Herbert Eye Institute, and at Children's Hospital of Orange County. He is a professor and chief of pediatric ophthalmology and eye mobile program in the Department of Ophthalmology at UCI. Dr. Saw is studying ocular therapies for cystinosis. Welcome, Dr. Saw. Thank you. I'm actually truly honored to be here today. Uh, yesterday I uh, got to listen in to everyone here and uh, got to listen to everyone's hope. And uh, I got to listen to the children, I got to listen to the parents. And I have to tell you, I, I was choked up. And um, I was uh, just truly, I'm truly honored to be here today and hopefully I could uh, give you some uh, there's a lot of confusion in the area of ophthalmology with, regarding cystinosis, and I hope to clear some of the misunderstandings and uh, some of the current research that's going on. So having said that, let's see. How do I go to the next one? It's this one. Okay, great. Um, I, saw, I heard one of the, uh, the children yesterday wanted to be a nephrologist, but then I didn't hear anybody wanted to be an ophthalmologist. So hopefully, <laughs> after today, I hope that many of the children here uh, would like to become an ophthalmologist. It's actually not, what? <laughs> I'm not sure about that. We got Paul, that's Paul. Okay. Okay, overview. I'm going to just uh, quickly talk about the, the of, co of course, we have to understand what the eyeball looks like. So that the, uh, and so I'm going to just talk about the anatomy and then how cystinosis impact the eyes. And then uh, I'm going to talk about some of the current research that we're working on right now. Okay, so here, this is going to be the most important slide that all of you, I want everyone to just listen to, please. Uh, please. So the light hits the cornea, which is this structure right here. And cornea is a very rare structure because it doesn't have blood vessels. If you think about it, almost every cells in your body have blood vessel supply because it needs oxygen. So there aren't too many things that have no blood vessels. And thank goodness it doesn't have blood vessels because you wouldn't be able to see because if you had blood vessels growing over that, then you have no vision. Okay, so that's very important. And then right behind it, we have this little space, and then we have this iris. This iris determines the eye color. Many of you have blue eyes, blue eye, uh, brown, uh, brown, blue, and hazel. So that eye color is very important. And I'm gonna tell you in just a little bit why that iris is very important in cystinosis. So stay with me. And right behind it, we have this lens. And then we have this space we call vitreous. And right behind there, we have the retina. Retina is like the uh, film. You remember the 35 millimeter cameras we used to uh, use when we were growing up. So it's like the film in a camera. So without that film, we cannot take pictures. So once that film takes the pictures, that image has to be processed. You remember how we used to take those films and take those 35 millimeter films to a Eckerd's or a place where they can process them? Well, that process occurs right here in the brain. So everything's all connected. So if you don't have good cornea, there's no picture. If you don't have good retina, there is no film to process. So this, the whole thing has to work. So if you have problem in the white matter or the gray matter in the brain, or if you have increase in brain pressure, that will impact your vision. Simple, okay? So having said that, let's just start from the front here. And sorry, I only have 15 minutes, so I'm gonna have to kind of zip through, and I'll be happy, I'll be, uh, we have busy clinic downstairs, and I'll be happy to answer more questions if you like, later. In the cornea, is covered by tear film. Just tear film, we could talk about it for an hour. It's that complicated. The tear film has mucin, 
water lipid layer. And then, and without the proper tear film, the cornea will be destroyed because you will have dry eyes and you will have scarring and then you have multiple, multiple different types of complications, which I'm going to just talk about in just a little bit. And that, that water has to, that tear film that I just showed you, it's exposed to all the dirt in the air. And so it has to wash all the dirt and dust and allergen, and then it has to leave the eyeball somehow. And it goes through the tear duct right here. You see? So that tear film is washed off and it goes into the tear duct and it goes into your stomach and your acid of pH of one or two will kill it. And that water comes back to the lacmo gland and it supplies the tear film again. Very, very important. That tear film is partially produced by the tear gland and also we have these cells that we call goblet cells in the eye that produces mucin layer. Okay. Now, let's talk about the cystinosis. What does that to do with the cystinosis? When you have cystinosis, you have these crystals that form right near the blood vessels. I just told you, cornea does not have blood vessels. So, but the conjunctiva is full of blood vessels. And so these crystals start to deposit right here at the limbus. And then you start to collect and collect more and more, and you can see these crystal depositing in the conjunctiva, the white part of the eye. The problem with that is that, remember I just told you, that's where the goblet cells are that produces the mucin. And then on top of that, these crystals to start to deposit in the cornea. So a combination of these crystals in the conjunctiva and the cornea is a problem not just for vision, but also for tear productions. And what happens after that is that this is what the healthy cornea looks like. We have the epithelium and we have the basement membrane, just like this. And if you accidentally scratch yourself, that epithelium had separated from the basement membrane. That's corneal abrasion. What happens is that when you have abnormal tear film plus the crystals that's forming between the layers of the epithelium and basement membrane, these epithelial cells will just shed. It will have erosions. And that's what causes dry eyes, erosions, corneal abrasions, and filamentary keratopathies. And then you can develop these type of wrinkling in the cornea. And that can really compromise your vision. So it's not the crystals that compromise your vision. It's a scarring process. And that's what makes it dangerous. Because over time, what happens is that these things start to develop that we call filaments. So these are filaments that, that moves. Like every time you blink, these filaments move with it, and it causes pain every time you blink. On top of that, you have new blood vessels growing into the cornea. Because remember, this area is scarred. So the, your body wants to fix it. So you have scarring formation along with blood vessels. We call corneal neovascularizations. And that leads to what we call bend keratopathy. So when you get to this level, then you will usually end up needing corneal transplant. And that's what we want to try to avoid. So... And on top of that, these crystals deposit on the iris, the brown blue eye color. Those are beautiful. So when, you, when I look, these crystals, I can see it in the iris because it's extremely vascular structure. Now, what, what's wrong with that? Iris has to constrict and dilate throughout the day. When we're in this dark environment, the pupil has to dilate. 
And when we go outside in the bright setting like today in San Diego, people has to constrict. But that mechanism do not work as well when you have these heavy crystals on the iris as well as the ciliary body. And so they cannot, you will not, you're not going to be able to accommodate. So what that means is that when you try to read a book or when you're trying to read something, it will start to cause headaches. On top of that, this crystal deposits on the iris can cause abnormality, abnormality and that can lead to glaucoma. The mechanism, I'm not going to get into too uh, much in, in detail, but it just basically prevents the fluid from inside the eye to leave the eyeball. So that can lead to glaucoma. And that can also cause headaches as well. So all these things can cause blepharospasms, headaches, and light sensitivity. And not just that, it impacts the retina. Because remember, retina has more blood vessels per space than anywhere else in your body. Because think about it. Signal has to be converted into an image. I mean, think about how much energy that requires. So when you have crystal deposits in the retina right here, you gradually start to lose central vision. So this is what it looks like when you get an OCT, ocular coherence tomography. So we use OCT, look for microscopic structures, and we can see these crystal deposits throughout the throughout the retina. This is what the normal retina looks like. And this is something that we can detect on many, if not all, patients of cystinosis. And so the, 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 these are some of the signs that they will lose. First thing they will lose is night vision and visual field and color vision. And we can confirm this using electroretinogram, ERG. And that's what we do. So how do we treat these patients? There are many different, you know, the focus of my talk is not, for, is not on treatments, but they're lubrications, contact lenses, hypertonic solutions. We have scleral lenses that would protect the cornea so that the cornea does not erode. And also, we, uh, there's this thing called punctal plugs. This is where we place the small plug into that nasal lacrimal duct system so that the little tear that they produce doesn't get wasted. So it will stay in the tear, it will stay in your, and, and, and lubricating the surface of the cornea. Makes sense, right? Okay. Sometimes these patients require surgery and we actually have someone here where we had to go and remove the epithelium in hopes that the new epithelium would regrow and scar down to the anterior basement membrane. But sometimes that doesn't work very well in patients with the cystinosis because the crystals prevent the adhesions. And if they continue to form recurrent scarring, then that's where we have to consider surgery with the corneal transplant. And there's some stu recent studies talking about using topical insulin and it's still investigational. And that's where Cicerine comes in. Uh, it was, it's been around since uh, tw uh, 2012, and every one of you have heard of Cicerine. It's a, it's a good medication. It's been around for a long time. The problem with the, any eye drops is that this chemical is unstable. So it has to be kept in certain temperature without light exposure at certain pH because it's very unstable. And that's why it comes all frozen. And, and that's the reason why it stings so much. It's a pH of 4.5. You're putting acid in your eye, if you could imagine. And if you put that in your eye, and I have, it stings. So that's normal response. And then sister drops came along. It's a methyl cellulose. Because this medication, when it first, was, uh, when it first came out, I don't know who came up with the idea of every hour. And let me tell you, I have three kids. I barely have, I could barely feed them three times a day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I just cannot imagine anybody putting anything uh, every, every hour. But so, you know, they're thinking, you know what, we're going to make the solvent thick using 
sodium methyl cellulose. And, and, and they found that it actually worked okay. Some people like it, some people don't, because it's very thick and it's very hard to get it out of the bottle. And so there's, there are pros and cons to both, but they both, I could tell you, work. Um, and you can see some patients with the improvement of the corneal crystals. And I'm just going to tell you that this is not in all patients. You do not want to wait till you have fully grown crystals and start to use this medication. You want to prevent it. You don't want to get to that stage because it's not a 100% success rate for these patients with cystic drops or cystarin. Uh, the obstacles that I've heard from everybody is that it's overwhelming, it's too much. I mean, Paul can tell you, I, you know, it's, it's over, I mean, I actually got to see the kids being fed with medications even during dinner last night. And I just can't imagine what you're going, you're going through every single day, just struggle. And I totally understand. And they say, you know what, Put, adding eye drops on top of that, that is just too much. And then also, burning sensation is, is difficult. And it also, getting it in is difficult. And then cost and avail is not available in every country. I totally understand. And that leads to poor compliance. But the problem is this. Is this. The cornea, you know, I actually have examined babies, infants with cystinosis, and I'm gonna just tell you, all of them, every single one that I've examined, if you look carefully enough in the, around the limbus, you see signs of crystals, 100%. But you have to look for it. Like, if you don't know that, you don't know, if you don't know what you're looking for, if you're not looking for it, you're gonna miss it. So they all have it. It's just that they continue to develop these crystal deposits very, very quickly, and about 90% of it is developed by the age of 10. And, and, and the thing is that you start to, you know, many pa patients, they try to control the crystals at this age, but I don't think that's a good idea. You want to try to tackle it as early as possible. And I've, I'm going to tell you right now, I was shocked. Just this morning, I've seen patients those kids that have been, that's been compliant with medications early on because they were scared because they were told that they could lose their sight and they had, so they were very, very compliant with medications here and right now they have, they're at the level of 0.5 and even though they're teenage, teenagers. So it is possible to reduce this progression of the crystal formations. So what are some of the tips that I can give you? Yes, they do sting, but this is something they do overcome over time. Using, remember the pH is 4.5, so putting some artificial tears before you put the actual medications will dilute it a little bit. That medication has to come at 4.5 pH because it's unstable. It's gonna get oxidized. So by putting something in the eye to dilute it just a little bit will help. And this is something that they can overcome over time. And second is that place it especially at nighttime. So what you do is that you have the child lying down and then putting the medication in while they, are ha that while they have their eyes closed. And because the lashes are pointing all toward the cornea, it will get there, even if they rub it. And keeping those eyes closed is actually very, very helpful because remember, when you're putting eye drops in in your eye, 95% of it gets wasted. Please quote me on this, okay? <laughs> that medication you're using, you're only paying for 5% of it. Hopefully we could get a discount on that, but it's expensive. 95% of it is not going into the eye, okay? You're putting only 5%, 5 so please, please, when you put it in, Try to close that punctal plugs by putting a gauze or something if they're old enough to comply. Young kids will never let you do that. So just place a gauze or something right over the tear duct to block it so that the medication would have longer time to be in contact. Of course, Cisadrop has an advantage over, cyst uh, over Cisteran on this particular area because it's thick. Okay? And that's why you don't have to use it as often. 
So the current studies, I'm just going to I'm just I'm going to I'm going to tell you that we're placing punctal plugs on these patients, and they're using the same amount of uh, the the, uh, the the system in drops, and we're trying to see. And we are measuring their ocular surface and, and following their ocular surface disease and seeing if the punctal plugs can actually be beneficial, not just on the cornea, but also on the retina. So we're following these patients because many of these patients actually have dry eyes because of the goblet cell involvement. And then also we're trying to correlate with the frequency of, of eye drops. I'm going to tell you right now, every one of you are using different regimen here. I could tell you, 100%. Everyone is using different, every one of you. Some people are using one, some people are using nothing, some people are using nine times. So I would like to see if the frequency correlate with the, with the, uh, the outcome. And also we want to see age of initiation has any impact. And also we're going to check for compliance. Does that really matter? And that's the data that we're collecting today, by the way. And then... I want to improve grading scale. The grading scale that's available right now is not very user friendly. So I'll, I'm trying to come up with a better grading system using red reflex. Because remember, if they have more crystals, you're going to have blunted red reflex. And that's what we're measuring today. And also, we're using, uh, so instead of having these huge number of different grading scales, I want to simplify it. And we're going to go from zero to five. And that is something that we're doing today, and it's working beautifully. And also, the last thing that I'm doing is that we have a machine that can measure the density of your cornea. So we are actually collecting data, and we're measuring the density and see if that density number correlates with these numbers here. And then last thing that I'm working on is telemedicine. We have, uh, as you probably saw, some of you, uh, we are using portable devices to take pictures of the cornea, also the retina. I would love to have these devices in the hands of the parents so that they can contact us directly and communicate through telemedicine. Yesterday, I was so impressed. And I, you know, I know this is called a day of hope. I hope we can turn this into a life of hope. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. That was pretty great. Um, we have time for maybe one quick question. And then I actually wonder, are you still looking for volunteers for your clinic downstairs? Or, no, we're all full. OK. So, OK, so you could get a hold of doctor. Oh, Dr. Grimm. The question is that when you put punctal plugs, now do they have too much tearing? We have four holes, upper, lower, upper, lower. We have a total of four holes where the tear drains. So we're only blocking two, one on the right and one on the left. And we're only applying plugs for patients who are showing, sign, who are showing some signs of dry eyes. So they have uh, if, if, if they're uncomfortable. Obviously, the, placing these plugs are difficult in young children because they're not going to be cooperative and we're going to have to put them to sleep. So as of right now, we're placing these plugs in older patients who are cooperative. So they tend to be teenagers. And many of these patients, if not all, have signs of dry eyes already because of the goblet cells are impacted. So again, the dry eyes is a very complicated topic, and I, you could invite me back for just simply talk to talk about dry eyes for an hour. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much, everybody, and I'll be in the clinic downstairs. Thank you.